Kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. Because of the mercies of God, which we have received, if we have trusted the gospel, if we are trusting in Christ and all the benefits that come with it, these are described as the mercies of God in verse 1. But because of that, because of those, the mercies of God, the pattern of the Christian life and true worship is to present ourselves, our bodies, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And this is not a one-time decision, but a pattern for life. And this is, I've called a self-sacrificial pattern. It is to be lived out in a holy way. That is a separate way, a way that is defined as we'll see today, not by some things in this world or this world. It's an acceptable way of living before God in light of His mercies. It's, it's not a payback plan. It's not, oh, we've received the mercies of God, now we're going to live this way in order to pay you back. We're never going to become even with God by the pattern of our life, by our righteous deeds. What He has given far as outweigh what we could ever give back to Him. The Son of God was the price that God the Father paid to show us mercy. We could never pay that back. Rather, the emphasis of this sacrifice is that of warrant and of a willing heart. We belong to God because of His mercies. It was because of His mercies that His Son laid down His life, that He shed His blood for us. And then we are taught, because of that, He purchased us by that blood. We are not our own. We have been bought with the precious blood of the Son of God. And He loved us and He gave Himself for us in this way so that we would not serve sin any longer, but that we would live to Him. And that living means that we live not just merely in warrant for the glory of God or for the uh, self-sacrificially as the pattern of life to pay God back, but we also do it willingly. We do it because we love God. We do it because we rejoice in what He's given to us in His mercies, what He's provided for us, not only now, but for eternity. This also doesn't mean then that our lives are now lived, though we are taught that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We don't live in a state of misery or despondency as Christians. It's incredible to look at the testimonies of believers in the last century that were under severe persecution because of communism or because of Nazism or because of some radical ideology that put them under bondage and to see what got those believers through those years in the gulag. And to see what got those believers through even to the point of giving their lives up as it were and to martyrdom. And we're not all called to give our lives up in, to martyrdom necessarily. We won't all called to be called to do that, but we are all called to live dyingly, to live in a way that is self-sacrificial for the glory of God because of His mercies. Through faith in Christ, we know that those who humble themselves before God will be exalted. This is not a wasted life. This is not a wasted pattern of living living self-sacrificially before God, we know was exemplified before us perfectly in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And death didn't hold him. Death had no power to hold him. This is why a self-sacrificial life for us means that we're more than conquerors while doing it. Because no matter what we give up in this world, we are gonna gain tenfold 
That is, we are going to gain imperfection in the life that follows. I believe verse 2 of Romans delves deeper into what it means to live a self-sacrificial pattern of life. As I've already said, the pattern of the Christian life in verse 1 models the gospel. That is, it models Jesus. It's, it models what we see of him in the gospel. At every point of Jesus' life and ministry, he did the will of God. And yet, at the end of his life, this world hated him and put him to death. We know what it costs, then, to do the will of God. And it costs in this world. It will cost us to do the will of God. And so we know that it means sacrifice. Doing the will of God will necessarily lead to self-sacrifice in this world of sin. But how do we know what the will of God is for our lives? Paul's purpose in verse 2, I believe, the Holy Spirit's purpose is to teach us some fundamental principles that we need for living sacrificially. And when I say that, I mean sacrificially, morally speaking, if sacrificially to live according to the will of God in this sinful world is to live sacrificially. And the only principle that we're going to look at this morning is the principle of nonconformity. Verse 2. Now, this is not to be confused with a 17th century movement in England of nonconformity. This precedes that by 1,700 years. This is speaking negatively. Notice the principle is put negatively. There is one that follows the principle of the renewed mind that is positively put, but this one is put negatively, and this is it. Do not be conformed to this world. And it, and it seems quite simple, but it's not simplistic. I'll tell you that. To do this is not simplistic at all. This negative principle speaks to what and how we think and what we give approval to and what we do. Conformed, this word conformed has to do with being pressed into a mold. That's the idea. Do not be conformed. I, I think of Plato. <laughs> Don't. Don't be like your children's Plato set that just, you know when the thing about Plato is it just gets in every cra crack and crevice, right? Who wants to be Plato? With, well, some things we want to be Plato. As we'll see, I think this principle is not just merely a negative principle in the first sense that it's been stated in Romans. What did he say back in Romans 8, 29? The very purpose, the very, the very process, the very eternal plan of God has to do with us being conformed to the image of Christ. That's the basis for this negative pattern. For those whom he foreknew, Romans 8, 29 said, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his soul, son, to be pressed into the mold of Christ. That's the purpose of God in eternity for his people, is to be like his son in order that we might be the first, he might be, that is Christ, the firstborn among many brothers. And this gives us a good hint regarding what exactly not being conformed to this world looks like. Simply put, very simply put, it looks like Christ. You want to know who was not conformed to this world? Jesus was not conformed to this world. You know, the evidence of that is the cross. Everybody in the world decided to put him to death. Because he wasn't of them. Jews and Gentiles alike, the whole world gathered together in Acts 4, according to God's sovereign plan, to put him to death. Because he was not of them. Conforming to Christ and not to this world is God's pattern for the Christian life. But what does it mean to not be conformed to this world. What does this world mean? Well, this world comes from the Greek wor word ion. Now, there's two gr Greek words often translated world, cosmos and ion. And ion has to do also with the idea of temporality, age, time. And this is a very important concept of how we need to think about not being conformed to this world. We find in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, the Paul calls Satan the theos of this ion, this, the God of this age. Satan is not God. Paul is not saying that Satan is God. But he holds a certain authority over this 
age, this time frame, even that we live in now. To be sure, by grace and by the mercies of God, we have been saved out of his dominion. Christ defeated him for us. Galatians 1, 3 through 5 says, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. How does peace and grace, how does that benediction come to us? Because the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, he gave himself up for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. That's the same Greek word, ion, according to the will of God, our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Although the Apostle John uses the Greek word cosmos in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, I think he means the same thing because he defines it the same way. This world in a temporal pattern, in a temporal sphere, is being described here. Do not love the world or the things in the world, do you? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's some big, that is a big contrast. That's, that's, that's a great uh, division there. You better be right about how you see this verse in yourself in light of this. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Now he defines what he just said, what he meant by loving the world or the things in the world. It's important. This definition is important. He says, for all that is in the world, listen, the desire of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life that defines our spirit of the age that we live in. But it's not new, is it? This is 2,000 years ago. This is not from the Father, but is of the world, and the world is passing away. You see that temporal nature of the world there? Even though he uses cosmos, he's still speaking of it as this temporal realm, as it were. Along with its desires, that will not remain, but whoever does the will of, the, the, the will of God abides forever. It's simply as I can summarize it, not being pressed into the mold of this world then means to not live in agreement with this temporal human rebellion against God. And it's temporal. It's not going to last forever. It's important. To not have the frame of mind to value the things that are now passing away above that which God has given us the right to value it. And we'll see why I made those qualifications there. But this is implied in what we're saved unto. Do you realize that, that everything that Paul is saying here negatively is already spoken about in a positive sense in Romans, in, in speaking about the benefits that come to us through Jesus Christ. What is, the, what is the thing that we have to look forward to? For the joy that was set before Christ, he endured the cross, but we are saved not into death, but to life. And that's not just a temporary life. It's not living our best life now by any means. Self-sacrifice is how he speaks about it in verse 1. Now it's not conformed to this world, which you will not get ahead in this world if you're conforming yourself to it in these days especially. So what does he mean? What, what positively comes before? What did Jesus win on our behalf? Well, Romans 5.21 says, so that as sin reigned in death, that's what sin brought, death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life. You see, one of the reasons that we don't live for the things that are temporary on this earth is because we weren't saved for it. This world is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3. Right? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. That's what it brings that's ruin and misery and despair and the tearing down of what God made good. But the free gift of God, this is grace, this is mercy, is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we live in a pattern that conforms to what the world seeks after, this rebellion, this temporary rebellion against God, we are living contrary to what we've been saved for and unto. It's really a denial of faith that we are saved unto eternal life if all we are is consumed by this temporary 
world, the lusts and the pride and what we can get now, what we can do for our advantage now. Does this motivate you? Is this what you're looking forward to? Some of you came today thinking, oh man, I hope he doesn't go long because there's a football game. <laughs> oh, I had to bring up the football game. At 1.30, if he goes long, I'm gonna have to leave early to get that game. It's important to understand, God did not show us mercy so that we should be conformed to that which leads to death. He did not save us unto judgment. That's what death means there. Unto condemnation. But rather that which leads to eternal life, which is what Christ's likeness looks like. And there are many wrong ways to go about non-conforming. There are a lot of not wrong ways. There are whole civilizations that are to this day living in isolation from society because they think that that's what it means to not be conformed to this world. They've run off and they've put themselves by themselves and they have no interaction. They try to not have interaction as much as they can. They do have some by necessity because they think they're living in accordance with this principle. So we need to ask ourselves, what does look, what was this non-conforming life looks, look like? Now, at this point, I'm going to borrow what the rest of verse 2 says. This is important. Because when we go outside of Scripture and we just decide, well, this is what non-conforming means, we will get it wrong. But look at what verse 2 says. But be transformed. There's a positive, by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. That's what we're concerned about, right? We want a non-confirmation with the world that accords with the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. Together, what my purpose, and this is not exhaustive at all. We could spend all year looking at what it means not to be conformed to this world. But Paul will do that as we go through the scriptures. As we go through Romans 12 and 13 and 14, I'm going to look at four observations this morning. First, non-conforming is not separating ourselves from the world altogether. When Jesus prayed to the Father in his high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 15, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world to his disciples. You know, he knew what he was sending them into. I send you into this world as sheep. <laughs> and they're the wolves. What do wolves do to sheep? They eat them. And they do it in terrible ways. If you've ever seen it, it's awful. It's a terrible, malicious death that those lambs go. And Jesus says, I'm sending you out to your slaughter. Wow. If you're going to be Jesus' disciple, you're going to have to be willing to bear a cross, aren't you? But he says, I don't ask that you take him out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one, from his snares, from his methods, from tripping them up, from falling into his traps. And there are numerous and multiple traps that he sets for us. The wiles of the devil in Ephesians 6. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10. The Apostle Paul speaks so appropriately to our minds these days. Did you know that sin has always been in the world? And it just didn't happen in the last 30 years? Christian in America. Do you know that what we see around us increasing, the darkness and sin that is increasingly accepted and promoted and celebrated in our culture has already been in the world? Look at, look at what Paul says. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral, immoral people. Okay, let's all go home, right? Listen to what he says, though. Associate... It comes with a very particular context, associate. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world. Huh? <laughs> what do you mean? 
or the greedy. Well, those are sinners too. Or the swindlers, they're sinners too. Or idolaters. That's everybody in our society that holds this creed. I should be able to do whatever I want to do. That is the creed of the idolater. It's just that we ourselves become the idol. If you can just decide what you want to do, you're God. Only God has that right. And that's the fundamental creed that our society lives by. No one can question what I want to do. You're not God. And you're an idolater if you think that way. But he says, wait, it's not from them I told you to come out from. Why? Since then you would need to go out of the world. If you're not going to associate with people that pattern themselves after those type of things, you're going to have to go out of the world altogether to get away from it because it's everywhere in the world. And Paul says, that's not what I'm calling you to do. So then non-conforming doesn't mean that we just leave all the sinners to their despair and death and sin and let them die in it, let them rot in it. Wow. Wow. Second, in fact, it's our marching orders from our Lord to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know what's implied in all of that? That the world is in sin and we are to go to them and they are to be changed by the message that we preach to them. That means far from Non-conforming means that we go out and we just don't have any contact from sinners. We are actually to go to them and proclaim the gospel. And you go, well, man, if I do that, I, people aren't going to like me. If I pray for the, my family hates me even when I talk to them about that. If you're going to be my disciple, you're, you're going to have to be willing to forsake all. That doesn't mean when Jesus says that you hate your father and mother and, and come and follow me, he doesn't mean that you have a hatred, you want to see them die, you want to see them get hurt. It means that you have to be willing to know that you will be separated from them. Not because you despise them, because they will reject you. They will. Paul applied above that associating with unbelievers, unbelieving sinners is part of what it means to go into the world. We associate with them at meals. You know, it's important that we understand distinctions. A lot of times people say, well, Jesus, he sat down with uh, harlots, you know, prostitutes and tax collectors. These were, you know, deemed the, the, the most evil people, sinners, right? He sat down with them, but Jesus also sat down with the Pharisees. <laughs> And he also sat down with the lawyers. And you know what Jesus did when he sat down with them? He preached to them himself. You know, it's important that we don't think that sitting down with sinners and, and the self-righteous means that we go along with everything they're doing. But it means that we're willing to sit with them. And we're willing to bear with them. We're willing to tell them the truth in love. That's hard. That's self-sacrificing. You will know what it is, feels like to be a living sacrifice when you do that. It's not easy. We are associating with them in business. Acts 16, 14. I'm not going to go through all of these things. It would take too long. And engaging of ideas. Acts 17, 1 Corinthians 15, Jude, verse 3. In government, we associate with them. In society, we associate with unbelievers, with sinners like this. In the New Testament. Not conforming to the world means instead of separating from the world altogether, spatially speaking, that we are, as Peter says in 1 Peter 2.12, to keep our conduct among the Gentiles honorable. That means while we are with them, we don't do the same sins that they do. We don't couple ourselves with their sin, and that's a tense, and that's a... That, that place to be, is a, it's got tension, doesn't it? It's a lot easier to feel yourself sanctified when you just don't get around anybody who sins. 
you feel like, hey, I'm really accomplishing stuff. I'm really advancing in my sanctification. Because no, you're not around anybody that you're taught to go bear the gospel to. Now, some will object and say, but the Bible says, and it says this in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, therefore, go out from among their midst. This is, this is the word of God. And be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. And he's speaking there about the ungodly. So, so what does non-conforming mean again, right? So this brings us to my next point. Third, non-conforming to the world, not conforming to the world means taking no part of and putting to shame that which is evil in the world. You see, 2 Corinthians 6.14 through 18, I just quoted verse 17 there, describes a closeness to this world that is defined in that context as partnership and fellowship. That is, you're not just sitting at meal with them, but you find yourself in agreement with them regarding their sinful practices, their ungodly ideas, their unbiblical view of life. You're now sitting with them in the seat of the scornful. You're walking with them on a road that is unrighteous. You're, you're arm in arm with them. That's what he's telling, don't do that. You cannot do that as a believer. That is conforming to the world. That's, that's the nature of it. There are boundaries to our associations with the world. Once our relationship with them associates by agreement with their unbiblical worldview and morality, we are conforming to the world. Paul goes further than this. He goes further than what he says even in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, which we didn't look into that in, in detail, but go to Ephesians 5 if you have your Bibles open. Because I find this makes the point of that the positive of conforming to Christ uh, promotes the, or is the opposite and, and helps us understand the negative of non-conformity to the world, okay? Ephesians 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, be imitators of God. Now, now, who was the perfect expression of God? Christ. He Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. When, when you want to know God, you know Christ. You can't know God if you don't know Christ. Okay? Therefore, be imitators of God. Be conformed to Christ as beloved children. That's what we are. That's who you are by the mercies of God. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, this is, the, this is part of nonconformity. We're walking in love. We're, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor crude joking. I just have to comment on that quickly. You know, one of the reasons I think our, our society has so quickly accepted a, an unbiblical morality, it's happened over uh, the space of maybe 50, 70 years, really, but so quickly now, is because we use, and the world and Satan is very, he's very smart and he's very wise to break down barriers by crude joking. When you make light of sin, it's a way to break down conscience barriers that we have to it. It's a lot easier to be accepting sin when it's put into a funny light. It's done every day. Look in the media. Look at entertainment. We are inundated with entertainment. It's no coincidence that we fall so fast, morally speaking. The entertainment world is plugged into our brains. We're practically just feeding our impulses from it. That's a different sermon, perhaps. Maybe it's not. That's next week. Listen, though. Which are out of place. These are out of place. They're not in consistency with the love and the, the mercies that God has brought us and the conforming to Christ that God has saved us for. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. That's good. 
For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. But we're not that, we're children of God. Therefore, do not become partners with them. You see that partnering there again? You see the fellowship? You do what they do, you agree with what they do in sin, and then you become their partner. And that demonstrates activities and thinking, ways, patterns of life that is associated with the children of disobedient, not children of God. That's being conformed to this world. For at one time you were darkness. This is all over the New Testament. This was you. But by the grace of God, Ephesians 2, that's not you anymore. That's not you. But now you, listen to this, you are light where? In the Lord. It's not because of yourself. It's Christ in you. Walk then as children of light. Be what you are. It's the same thing Paul is saying in Romans 12 too, for the, 1 and 2. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern, and we're going to talk about this next week, God willing, what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead, listen to this, expose them. Now that's taking us even further than just leaving them. Expose them. This is back to our commission. It's much easier to separate ourselves from sinners than to expose their sin by living as children of light. That is doing righteously, and think about this, in a world that doesn't accept your, in the biblical view, of righteousness. It looks different. The very threat to the church nowadays, primarily, Last century, I would have said it was theological, doctrinal. It still is that. But morality is why so many people are leaving the church. We have been convinced, so many in the church, that the morality that the world is preaching and promoting, which leads to death according to the Word of God, is actually the true righteousness is actually the true good. They're calling good evil and evil good. And we are falling all over ourselves to fit in to that pattern. At a rate that's astonishing. But instead, he says, expose them. Our society has come full circle on this such that not only are Christians ashamed to call sin sin in the public square, we have more and more begun to approve and take part in the same sinful acts and so fall under the condemnation. And I'll tell you why so many Christians are afraid to call sin sin in the public square. Because we're cowards. That's why. Because we don't want to live self-sacrificially. We don't want to lose our position at our job. We don't want to lose the acceptability of the guild. You know? We don't want our friends to think we're stupid. Oh, you believe that antiquated book? Yeah. We believe that Jesus reigns at the Father's right hand. And, and he died for us. He's forgiven me of my, our sin. This world knows nothing about forgiveness apart from the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't know anything about it. I was talking to Kyle about this beforehand, or Brother Jason bef beforehand. It doesn't know anything about mercy apart from Christ. And it's more and more becoming evident. If you do something that the world doesn't like, you're censored, you're done, you're, you're out, you lose your job, you lose your place in society, you're anathema. You can't apologize enough times if you break their code of ethics. There's no forgiveness. There's only eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Oh, live as children of light. Live as children of light. But listen, so many of us have been not only unwilling to speak the truth, we've gone so far to approve the falseness and the sin. 
that we come under the condemnation of Romans 1.32, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Falling into the mold of reprobate thinking of the world to support such sin has come to mean in the world that we are showing love, that's what they want to say, to affirm our transgenderism. Let's put some names to it. To, to affirm my sexual orientation or my fornication. He's talking about sexual immorality, pornea. It involves all of these things and they were all in the world back then. Men who were effeminate, he talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's just love to accept us. It's just love to promote what we're doing. And the Bible says that leads to death. Those sins, people that practice them unrepentantly, leads to death. That is judgment from God. Brothers and sisters, do not believe them when they tell you what love is. Not being conformed to this world means that we will love like God loves, who tells us the truth about ourselves and about our sin, so that we will be saved, so that we will have eternal life. And it really comes down to whether or not you'll believe the truth of God, or if you'll believe the wisdom of this world, which is passing away cannot stand. But listen to, listen to what is at stake in Ephesians, living according to, as children of light or living as children of darkness. Listen to what the result is of the apostle, the desire. He's talking to a church and he's saying, you cannot conform to this world because if you do, the following won't happen. He says, Ephesians 5, 12 through 14, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Shameful. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Who, who's that light? It's the light of God in us, in the, in the pattern of our life, right? It becomes visible for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, this is what that light says to the world who's living in darkness. This is what it says. Awake, O sleeper. Arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. You see? God will use the pattern of righteousness that he has saved you for to shine into the darkness of sinners and so bring their sin to light in them. Not everyone, by any means, are we promised. And so that they'll see, in the end result, the light of Christ. You see, it's for their salvation. It's not for their condemnation that Paul says this. Jesus says, I did not come into the world to condemn the world. The world is already in condemnation. It didn't need me coming into the world for them to be condemned. But that through me, believing on me, they might be saved. And that's what we're doing when we walk as children of light, being imitators of God, conformed to Christ. Fourth, not being conformed to this world is not defined by religious traditionalism. And this might make us a little uncomfortable here. It's good. Not being conformed to this world is not defined by religious traditionalism. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some, that's where we're at now. We've been there since Christ ascended. Some will depart from the faith. That's what's at stake here. Departing from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, that which is not in agreement with God's word, and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like forbidding in marriage, requiring abstinent from, abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Listen to this. This may seem like a small thing, but he says many will depart from the faith who fall into these snares. 
It is the regular fashion of the self-righteous to burden the conscience of those who are set free by Christ. You hear that? It's the regular fashion of the self-righteous to burden the conscience of, or set free by Christ. And this was true in biblical times and it's true today. Colossians 2, 20 through 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you were still alive in the world do you submit to regulations? Listen to these. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. You see that, human precepts and teachings? Notice the temporality of what Paul is saying. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the bottom but body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. The temporal quality of such worldly wisdom fits right into the mold of worldliness. Oh, here's how you are righteous. You don't want to eat that kind of food. Oh, don't eat that kind of food. Uh, you know, if you follow these 10 steps that I've, I've thought through, you're going to be such a, a great person in this world for God. And you need to do them or you're not accepted by God. Right? This is, this is the pattern of every cult. They condemn people by burdening them with traditions and with commandments to make them appear righteous and all they do is add weight and condemnation to them before God. And it looks wise. It looks wise to the world to, to say that I'm a Christian because of the way that I look. You know, I don't, I don't go in the sun. I don't get tan because I don't want people to think that I'm being, you know, but then, then on the other end, it's, it's oh, you, you have to have a tan. Otherwise, people won't think that you're trying to fit in, you know. You make, we make a litmus test for people just based on wisdom that comes from us. This is how you're a real, a real Christian. You've got to do these things. You've got to observe these rituals. You've got to follow in, in the likeness that I've set out for you as a teacher. You see... This is why we have to have renewed minds. We have to know what is the will of God, and, and this is why we come to the scriptures to, be, to determine what is true righteousness or not. Remember that it's really hard to determine somebody's righteousness by the things they enjoy or don't enjoy. You say, wow, how can you say that? Well, Jesus, didn't he talk about John the Baptist? He didn't come drinking or eating anything. He was eating locusts in the wilderness, living a simple life, and they hated him. They hated him. He had the truth, and they looked at those things, and they, oh, you know, what a terrible person. And Jesus came, and he says, I came eating and drinking wine, he says, is it implied. And you call me a glutton and a wine bibber. That didn't do me any good in your sets of in your views of righteousness either. You see, you see, defining righteousness based on a few set principles that we think are necessary is not God's way of conforming to Christ. Customs and traditions, even religious ones, are inadequate tools for defining righteousness. They can also keep us, here's something important for us, they can keep us from fulfilling our calling to go into the world. Oh, those people, those be, he, he smokes, I'm not gonna go talk to him. You know, or, and I've already talked about sins, and we're, we're supposed to go to those people and witness to them and tell them the gospel. Do not be conformed to this world by equivocating the traditions of man with the commandments of God. Listen, Mark 7, 7, 8. In vain do they worship me, teachings, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men, and this is what happens as a result of it. When you do that, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the traditions of men. In vain, that's, that's, that's vanity to do that. Now, this doesn't mean we don't just throw off all wisdom and discernment. 
This doesn't mean that we can't say to our teenage daughter, you need to be modest when you go out there in this world. You're not just to fit in with the way you dress. You are to live in a way that shows the inward nature of who God has called you to be. Not just to heap attention on yourself. And also we don't tell them, go out there in drab colors, make everybody just look at you and go, wow, that is a creepy person. What's going on there? No. All that is just human wisdom. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not apparel. It's not what you put on. It's not, it's not any of those things. It's righteousness, godliness, humility, mercy, justice. That's not being conformed to this world as it's defined by the word of God. Let's pray. Father.